Hey everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Dmitry from Lucid Software. I'm a software engineer working on Lucid Charts integrations with third party tools. Uh, we have a lot of Atlassian add ons that we've developed. And with me are two Bitbucket engineers, Chris and Eric. Uh, you want to introduce yourself and uh, what you do at Atlassian? Yeah, for sure. Uh, hi, Dimitri. So I'm, uh, I'm Eric, and I am a, uh, as you pointed out, I'm a uh, developer on Bitbucket. Uh, I work mostly on backend related things and plugin system stuff. Uh, and I've been working on uh, Bitbucket for uh, seven years now. Hey, Dimitri. I'm Chris, and I work very closely with Eric. Uh, I've been on working on Bitbucket for three years, and I do a lot of the same types of roles. I work a lot on the ecosystems and trying to get people to be able to integrate Bitbucket with their products. Great. And uh, how long have you been at Atlassian, uh, Chris? I've been you know, for a little over three years, three and a half years okay. or so. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, you both have only been on the primarily on the Bitbucket teams and. Uh, I guess you can be called Atlassian uh, veterans. Yeah, I've only worked on Bitbucket. It's the only product I've worked on since I've been at Atlassian. Yeah, I've been here a bit longer. I've been here almost a decade now. So like, uh, Bitbucket was not a thing when I was at Atlassian. So I've worked on various different things. Like, uh, I mostly had a, a Java background. Uh, but uh, Bitbucket is all Python, almost entirely Python. And so for the last seven years or so, it's been mainly Python. And I was also a Java developer before I started working on Bitbucket. Bitbucket was my first full-time job doing Python work. Great. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with what Bitbucket is, maybe you want to give a quick one-minute intro, what it is? You want to give a marketing plug for it? <laughs> and give it a shot. Go for Bitbucket it. Is, a, is a code hosting site. Uh, it initially started out as a Mercurial code hosting site. And over the years, it grew to support uh, hosting Git as well. Um, it has a, a lot of features that are, so code hosting is part of it, but a part of code hosting is the review process. So Bitbucket has built in issue trackers. Um, the code reviews are probably the most important pull request system. Um, and it's, a, it's designed to be a place where developers spend their day. They are create, uh, collaborating on code, making comment on pull requests, doing code reviews, and getting code merged in so that uh, if they can get code released and reviewed and deployed, all those other things. Um, and that's kind of where this conversation comes in, is that we want Bitbucket to be that central place where code is managed. And so we want to give to let other developers add tools so that uh, developers can spend their, their days in Bitbucket and integrate with all the tools that they would use to get their jobs done. That's great. And uh, we, we at Lucid use Bitbucket. Uh... All, all developers spend at least some time in Bitbucket every day reviewing each other's code, um, looking at build status. And the great thing about Bitbucket and all Atlassian products is that they have a rich add-on ecosystem, which adds you adds bits of functionality or put data together from different applications into one single place where people work, collaborate, and make sure they, they're on the same page. Uh, I actually met Chris and Eric at Atlassian Connect Week in Austin just uh, a little bit less than a month ago. And I had a blast at the event. And uh, these are two super bright individuals that helped me develop a Bitbucket add-on that uh, we will see later in the show. Uh, but for now, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the developer experience uh, for uh, Atlassian products and specifically Bitbucket. Uh, you guys want to take it from here? How, how does it look like to develop a add-on, maybe specifically for Bitbucket Cloud? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let me, let me give you a little bit of background on uh, sort of wh where we came from with Bitbucket. Uh, so Bitbucket was a was an acquisition, right? We did not, uh, at last, did not write uh, Bitbucket from scratch. Uh, we had acquired it uh, in, in 2010, in, uh, and it came uh, uh, with a REST API, and that was about it. And so you could do uh, rudimentary things as external uh, as an external application. Um, and a lot has happened since. Uh, but sort of to start there is that you know, we, we acquired this product, had a REST API, um, which was you know, the rage at the time, this is 2010. And, uh, and it, uh, it had flaws, uh, or rather sort of, you know, the typical limitations of REST APIs where uh, uh, like 
applications tend to become pretty chatty that you build on top of them, uh, where you know you, you make a request, you get a whole bunch of uh, things back, and you have to filter out the things that you're actually after, or uh, you know you get a you get a, a resource or an object from the API, but you need related information with that as well, and and oftentimes you end up having to make another query to another resource to get that stuff in, or worse, sort of an n plus one type problem, and uh, and so. Uh, the external experience wasn't always great, um, which is not necessarily a bit of a thing. I mean, that, that's pretty typical with REST APIs. You have to strike the right balance between chattiness and, and functionality when you build an API. And, uh, and there's a couple of things that we've done uh, uh, over the past years to improve the situation there. And so like, maybe we can start there and, and run through some of those things that, that we've done. And then after that, maybe we can, uh, we can Talk about the, uh, the the present day experience through uh, like the the modern plugin system a little bit. Um, yeah, so, so sounds good. Uh, certainly, yep. REST API uh, REST architecture um, has been a very common pattern in web applications, and at the core of it is the representation of resources as this network of interconnected objects and suppose I I have a pull request and I want to get the information about the author of the pull request uh, to do that I should probably uh, follow the link to download the information about the author and then if I want to display information about the repository I follow another link and as exactly a, as yeah a precisely right I yeah that's uh, that... following links uh, for, for a long time before I can actually get all the information I want to display on the page Yep, it's a very typical uh, typical REST issue, right? So that's the kind of thing that we try to uh, to sort of address. Again, uh, let's share it my screen, yeah, so we can bring up uh, some slides. So this is a these are some slides from a deck that we used earlier at Connect Week that you mentioned, uh, where uh, you were too, and a bunch of other developers um, that talks about some of the details about uh, of Bitbucket's current. Uh, API and, and plugin system. And so I'm just going to cherry pick a few slides from here um, to uh, highlight some of the things that we uh, that we did to address that. Um, one of the things um, that we did was uh, uh, we added a sort of a query language to every uh, REST resource that returns a collection. Everything. And so there's a, a standard uh, standard set of queries that you can add to any uh, endpoint. To do things like this, right? So here's an example right here at the top, where um, this is the issues the issue tracker in Bitbucket, and uh, and you can do things like this, where you know give me the issues that are open or new um, and do not have an assignee yet, and uh, uh, that makes sense for an issue tracker. Uh, but we have uh, we have this apply to every endpoint, and so if you look at the bottom example, um, here's you know give me all the repositories of my team. However. Only the ones that um, have foo in their name and uh, have recently been updated, stuff like that. And so, like that is one thing that we uh, uh, that allowed us to uh, like cut out a lot of the uh, uh, like repetitiveness and, and slack of uh, of API usage, where you can hone in directly on the stuff you need uh, and uh, and generally be a bit a lot more productive. Without uh, this query language, how would I go about say? We can use the same example, retrieving all the teams repositories that were recently updated that match a certain name pattern. You would be left to do the, all the filtering yourself. You'd really have to query all of the objects from the Bitbucket API and then take them and find the ones that meet your criteria. So it would be a lot more calls over the network because our APIs are paginated and just a lot more logic that would have to live in your servers. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there's other stuff uh, that we uh, that we added. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice here is the uh, sort of the, the, the field names. All right, so it uses reporter username here. Um, those are not random strings. These are effectively uh, sort of JSON paths, if you will, in our uh, our API objects. And so like we we publish a schema, the JSON schema of uh, all the objects that go in and out of the API. In, uh, and so issue has a JSON schema, and one of the elements is reporter. Uh, now, reporter itself is uh, is of another type, is of, of type user. 
yeah, that has a schema too, and that uh, decline, uh, declares username. And so what we're doing here is uh, we can traverse effectively uh, the, 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 the fields uh, recursively into objects. And so that's what's happening here. And so uh, what you said earlier were, you know, otherwise, if you have a pull request and you want some information about the you know, author of the pull request, you would perhaps typically expect to be able to follow, you know, the link to a user object, request that resource, yada, yada. Uh, in this query language, we can traverse uh, these objects effectively on the server side by declaring, and you can nest this very deeply um, and, and do queries that way. It's, it's, it's like joins in, in SQL, essentially, right? That's what you're doing. That looks awesome. Yeah, normally I would, normally reporter would be a hyperlink to the reporter resource, but I'm having the server, the Bitbucket server, do all the work for me in retrieving the username of that person, right? Yep, precisely, yep. And so along with that, something that kind of dovetails nicely with that is that uh, we have, when we specify an API endpoint, we have a standard set of fields that we would like to, re that we would return by default. Uh, we kind of take a look at the, at the objects and make sense, try and make sense of what we think most people are going to want to use. Uh, but we're, we're targeting the average use case and not everybody is going to want to make the, to grab exactly the same fields. And so in order to try and reduce the number of round trips that you need to make to our server, if you get a repository and you can see that owner in the list of repositories, um, but you want a few more fields about that owner, it would be nice if you could, we could reduce the number of calls that have to get made back to Bitbucket in order to retrieve that data. Uh, in the normal REST API, you would see that, yes, there is a link to the owner and we're going to go in and retrieve it so that we can find more information about that owner. Instead, in Bitbucket, what, we did, what we've done I think this is the right slide. Is this it? Um, this is an example of cutting stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is an example of cutting things out. So just if you want to reduce the amount of traffic that's going back over the network, you can specify that these are the only fields I want in the API response. A normal, if you're retrieving the pipelines in this case here, it's not going to return this large JSON object. But for my application, I don't really care about the links. I'm not going to follow them. The only thing I really want to know is. Uh, what the state was and what the hash that we built was. So I can just sit, tell Bitbucket that I am only interested in these fields. And if you take a look, it's a little small, but you can see that this follows that JSON path type syntax that Eric was just mentioning. So we have a state field, and in the state field, there is a name. And then the same, similarly with target, um, here's the state field and the name. and kind of scrolls off the page, but you can see the target, and down, there will be a commit object embedded into that, and that would have a hash link. So this allows you to really customize that output. Um, it, it, expect, it, include, sorry, it, it supports wildcard expansion as well, and so you can actually see all of the fields that we could possibly produce while you're testing things, and then you can kind of customize exactly what this output is going to look like and get exactly the type of response from the bucket you would like for your specific application. Yep, here's a, just to quickly go through it, here's sort of the, the kind of things it can do. Uh, the other thing is you, so we, we just removed fields. You can do the opposite also, like what Chris mentions. You can add additional stuff into a response that normally would not be re, uh, returned. An example is uh, uh, the pull request uh, uh, endpoint on Bitbucket returns like large pull request objects, uh, but it doesn't include, by default, doesn't include the reviewers because uh, it's relatively expensive for us to compute. Uh, but if you do uh, in fields, and then you add in uh, values.reviewers in this case, then uh, this chunk gets added at runtime. It's, uh, so that's sort of to give you like an idea as to like, sort of the, the power of, of that. Um, so we can remove things, subtract things by removing links, minus links, and, um, and or, or as you saw earlier, like only return very specific fields. And again, you can traverse uh, recursively into, uh, into the, the document. This is very powerful, and I, I would like to emphasize that this is not something that every web application has in the REST APIs, and I'm sure that other developers who've, who's, who've worked with other products, REST APIs, will agree. So this really cuts down the development time, and as uh, Chris and Eric mentioned, it uh, cuts down a lot of unnecessary back and forth between uh, your application and uh, the third-party application you're trying to integrate with. But, yeah, it's it's a little bit uh, perhaps like uh, like 
like like GraphQL in some ways, right? Where uh, like these problems are not new. Uh, everybody's run into them, uh, especially people designing APIs. And, uh, and, and it's no rocket science. It, it's hard to, to you know strike the right balance to produce an API that is that is uh, clean and easy to understand and, and productive and, and efficient. And uh, and so what we've done here with uh, you know making the schema objects traversable. Um, and be able to pull in additional things at runtime. It's not that different from uh, what GraphQL uh, uh, does as well, right? It's, it's done in a different way, but it's sort of, it aims to solve a very similar uh, problem. Yeah, With sense. the idea that we can allow clients to use more of your standard REST toolkit that most people, most developers out there can easily grab their existing HTTP client libraries and attach a new query parameter to it. And it doesn't require a new set of tools to be able to do something. It's probably the biggest difference between this and what GraphQL does. Yep. Right. It all fits into a uh, standard um, HTTP protocol with the, the REST approach. Yep. Now, so far we've talked about REST architecture and REST APIs and how you might use your code to read and write data into Bitbucket. Uh, but what if I want to extend Bitbucket's user interface? Am I, uh, am I able to do that? Yep, for sure. Uh, so the, let, me, let me share my screen again. Um, so this brings us to uh, Connect, uh, our uh, larger sort of integration framework that is part of uh, Bitbucket as well as the other Atlassian applications, where we allow uh, external developers not just to interact with our API, but uh, have them add UI elements to the uh, to bitbucket.org. And uh, now let me show you how that works. Well, you obviously know how that works. In fact, I'm going to uh, use your add-on that you developed uh, last month as an example. So in Bitbucket, if you go to your settings and you go to, you'll find integrations, you'll find a sort of built-in list of uh, add-ons that you can install. And, uh, and let, me, let me show you what happens. Um, I'm adding your Lucid chart diagram here by just installing it. Um, this brings up a little grant uh, screen where I am, as the end user, I'm granting uh, Lucid chart uh, access to some of my data. And uh, that's it, it's now installed. If I now go to one of my repos, let me reload this page, and you'll see that on the left-hand side, um, I now have a, a new item here, class diagram. Uh, if I click that, that loads uh, your extensions uh, backhands. This is not part of Bitbucket that you're seeing. Um, and uh, the, uh, what this add-on does is adds an entire page where uh, you guys are generating a whole class diagram for uh, for my project here, and, uh, and so this is very powerful. You can, you can add all kinds of things to the uh, to the UI, and it looks as if it was part of it. Right, you where, where actually this whole right side is an iframe to my application, but nobody can tell. Exactly. Yes, it's very good that you pointed out. Like this is all iframe based. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and there's communication between the, the frames. Uh, I can, but it hosts, it comes from a different domain. I can click these things and uh, it takes me to uh, the line in the, in, the, in the source code where that stuff was declared. And so very brief, that is sort of the, the power of that, that whole plugin framework. It goes well beyond just APIs. But they are very much built on the on the API infrastructure. So a lot of what and Dimitri can speak a little bit more to what he actually did here. But a lot of what Dimitri did here is he is, you know, in order to generate these diagrams, he is building a lot of this on top of our REST APIs, uh, both from his backend service to be able to pull down this data to be able to create these graphs, and then assume you're using some some front end calls as well to be able to, again, interact with those Bitbucket APIs through that all building on everything that we discussed earlier to try and. Right. The next it. framework allows for a much, much deeper integration between your application and Bitbucket in this case. Now, I could have written a standalone application that pulls all the repository data through a REST API and displays it in some separate third-party app. But uh, what I've built here is it really looks like a natural part of Bitbucket. You have your code and the class diagram is just one of the pages on your repository, and you don't feel like you're leaving the product when you interact with the add-on, uh, which 
usually leads to a much better, smoother, seamless user experience. Uh, so if you haven't checked out Connect Framework for Bitbucket or other Atlassian cloud products, I highly recommend that. Yep, exactly. And so one other thing that I'd like to mention is that in these iframes, uh, you end up uh, typically talking to the Bitbucket API to pull in uh, data from Bitbucket. Uh, maybe also talk to your own backend, uh, backend API to pull in data from, from your side. Um, and, uh, and as I said earlier, there's a communication between the iframe, the child iframe, and the outer Bitbucket iframe. Um, and one of the things that that is used for is to facilitate um, API calls to the Bitbucket API. Um, and, and you can see sort of where that fits in, because if you're in an iframe, and say you wanted to you know, uh, display some information about uh, a file in the Bitbucket repo, you first have to download that file. And uh, so how are you going to get to it? Well, that would mean uh, having to make a, like a call to the right endpoint, and you have to authenticate that endpoint also. And, uh, and so we wanted to take care of that as well. Uh, and so what we ended up doing is offer a JavaScript uh, uh, interface API in the iframe that can be used to make calls directly into the Bitbucket API without having to go through the trouble of uh, authenticating. And that looks like this. Let me just switch to my editor here. Um, there we go. Um, so here is a little fragment of code that you would use to, inside your iframe, make a call to the Bitbucket API. Um, and this is all. And so we inject a, uh, a global uh, variable AP. Um, and from there on, you can make requests uh, through the request object or thing. Uh, in this case, I'm invoking the public Bitbucket API uh, 2.0 repositories. This is one of my repos. Um, I don't have to bother about putting the host name in there and things like that. Um, I don't have to authenticate this. Um, I just invoke this. And when that when I do that, it gets authenticated as the uh, end user viewing the page. Um, so, so all of that is there. Um, and then uh, we did a, a similar thing for uh, when you want to talk to your backend, as in like you oftentimes you want to you know, pulling stuff from your own uh, add-on, and, uh, and then you sort of you sort of face similar problems. Right? Yeah, exactly. So as we started to build out a bunch of applications internally, so Bitbucket itself tries to use the Connect framework for building ex new functionality into Bitbucket. Um, and as we were building a lot of applications, we realized that we were trying to solve a lot of the same problems over and over again. Um, that that we needed to do authentication that Bitbucket was doing, that we needed to have a lot of the same REST infrastructure. And so we wanted to try and come up with a generic way that we could help ourselves out, really, in trying to develop these connect add-ons and letting them offer an API that you, they could call from the front end. Because most <clears throat> interesting applications are going to need some way to talk to their own server, uh, if they have a server component at all, to make sure that they can retrieve data, more expensive calculations, more data that is stored on that server side. Yep. And so uh, what we did was uh, we built a, uh, a tunnel or proxy, whatever you're going to call it, um, uh, where you, from your iframe, can make a call to your own backend um, using basically the same code. It looks like this. So just to switch that back and forth, it is, oops, it is virtually the same code. Um, uh, however, you can now use proxy requests. And uh, other than that, it's the same. So this uh, URL gets added uh, on the fly to your add-ons URL that you have already described when you installed the, uh, the application. Um, and, um, uh, and again, uh, we take care of authentication. Yeah. What that means is that this request really first goes to Bitbucket, uh, and then we proxy it on to your backend. And the authentication that takes place is that this request, when it goes to us first, um, gets authenticated as the end user again. Um, and so um, like it doesn't matter what, other, what kind of auth the system is using at that point, it's transparent to you. Uh, when it arrives in our proxy, um, then uh, we authenticate the request, and, uh, and we forward it on uh, using the uh, standard uh, JOT signing that we do with uh, all the uh, add-on traffic. And so like, you don't end up or having to store end user credentials. Um, uh, and, uh, and the whole thing is transparent. 
Now to bring up, leaving this code example, bring up one more slide here um, to place that a little bit. Uh, bringing up this slide, sort of uh, tries to explain how this traffic works. And so, and all the stuff that it does. And so, in the browser, in your iframe, uh, you're doing that get, as I just uh, showed the uh, example code for. What happens really is that um, we make a request to Bitbucket, API to Bitbucket.io um, slash teams, and then your add on uh, as a prefix, and then your path that goes to our proxy. We do the authentication. We also do authorization, um, as in you can declare uh, uh, that you know the calls need to have certain levels of permission, um, and then ultimately that goes uh, and gets forwarded onto your uh, to your add-on, and then the response comes back again. Um, the way that you declare, because there's a there's a lot of things going on here. Um, the uh, this we have gone through um, so a lot of things going on here and uh like to just go through a couple of these sure so eric has already touched on the fact that we do authentication and he briefly touched on permission checks but if in your endpoints you wanted to access one of the bitbucket objects if, you, if your your path included a repository or a pull request um, we allow you to say that in order for somebody to access this this path on your server, that you're going to that, that that user is going to need to have write access to the repository, or they are going to have to have admin access to the owner of the repository, or something along those lines. Um, your add-on typically doesn't have that type of information. That permission or that, that access log model lives inside of Bitbucket, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we gave add-ons a way that we could protect them from getting those calls and then having to turn around and make calls back to the Bitbucket through APIs, it would, be, it would become a very chatty experience. And so we want to be able to enforce those permission checks right on the proxy before the, before the add-on ever sees that call. And it allows the add-on to uh, not worry so much about all those various models that can go on. It's just, it, it, it gets handled by Bitbucket before the call ever gets there. Um, and we have object completion. Yeah, sure. So and another thing that this that this does is uh, this sort of goes back to the stuff we talked about earlier with the field inclusion and exclusion, where you can pull in or remove fields from from objects. Um, we wanted to uh, to bring that to uh, uh, to add on traffic as well. And uh, as an example, uh, let me show you this. So here is an example of like a response from you know your add ons backend. Um, that goes through the AP, through our API proxy and then ultimately to the browser. And what you can do is, and what typically happens is that when you uh, when, when your, your add-on you know augments some some Bitbucket data typically, right? So like, uh, uh, and and so when you return your type of resource, whatever that might be, um, that may have an owner, right? Or or it may be attached to a repository or something Bitbucket. And um, what you can do then is that in your response you would return you know this JSON blob, and uh, and one of one of its one of the fields is user, and user really is a Bitbucket user object, but you on your backend you don't have all the metadata about every user in your system, nor should you be trying to you know synchronize that data, um, and so all you're really able to do um, is include whatever sort of primary identifier that you do keep track of, like for instance the username or case of repository, maybe a path or something like that. And that's fine, because we don't want you to have to uh, store all that data. So what happens is that when you include a, uh, like a, a Bitbucket object, which is identified by like the sort of the, the mandatory type element, uh, if that comes back through the proxy, the proxy is going to look at your JSON response. It's going to pick up on the fact that, hey, this user thing is something I understand, because it's a type user. It's a Bitbucket uh, schema, in fact. The, the user schema in my in my JSON schema definition, and so what it does then it uses the uh, data that you did provide in this case for instance uh, username uh, to in our database look up that object and replace this sort of condensed version with the full user object bam there you go and um, and it does that for all the the Bitbucket objects that it recognizes so if you return uh, an object that includes a uh, like a pull request, for instance, the exact same thing happens. Like we inject the entire big pull request object. And now, since we have all that data in the response, um, 
the, uh, the field inclusion exclusion works uh, also uh, because you could now, um, as in the client on the browser, you can uh, include and exclude fields as you normally would. So all of that is possible uh, from a response that came from a backend that didn't even know about, you know, like all the all the ins and outs of a pull request or a repository. And so like cuts down on a lot of chatter. Yes, and it and enables a front end to really rely on these fields. And so even though the back end of your add-on never knows what the display name is for error, the Eric user, the front end can grab that display name field and use it in the UI to, so that we can uh, still provide a very rich experience in the front end. Yep, this is very powerful. When I was developing my add-on, uh, this feature alone probably saved me at least a day of development. Uh, I do send some data back and forth between my add-on UI and back to my server, and I had to write zero server-side code to retrieve Bitbucket entities. So I didn't have to write a client to get the repository and then the list of commits or the list of users. I was able to send that from a client-side request that looked like just like a simple HTTP request uh, back to the server with Bitbucket putting all the information I need as just simple query string parameters on, on the request that gets sent to back to my server. So uh, that is really awesome and it really, really makes the uh, complexity of interacting with a third-party API rather flat. There's no added work I would need to do if I need to um, retrieve a new field, for instance, uh, from the buckets uh, compared yep. to what I have now. Yep. Yep. And so we are running up against time, but I, if there's time, I wanted to show you one last slide um, that sort of ties in with this nicely, and, uh, and that is that like this sort of injection of data uh, happens in the, in the response direction, but it also happens in the request direction. And for that, I'm going to open a switch to this slide, which um, it's a little complicated, but really what this does at the end of the day, it declares one of those proxy routes that your add-on um, declares, right? So when you install an add-on, this describes your add-on. Yeah, this proxy rule um, uh, basically describes that, you know, this inbound URL um, on, you know, Bitbucket's proxy side um, is going to be mapped to this URL on your backend. Yeah, and, uh, and then there is there is some substitution going on here. Um, here, we declare uh, two variables, repository and target user, um, which are things that Bitbucket understands. Repository is just, you know, repository. Basically, what this does is that um, uh, at runtime, when we see this URL come in, then uh, whatever is in this path segment must be a repository UUID or, you know, like a, a, a path slug or, or something that uniquely identifies the repository. Uh, we will look that up on the fly and make the repository, an instance of the repository schema effectively available to the generation of the destination URL. And so from there on, you can refer to properties on that repository object like UUID, but also for instance, owner.username or anything that you can traverse through the schema and inject it directly into your destination URL. That means that you can uh, augment your, uh, your, your, your inbound requests but a ton of additional data that uh, your iframe itself doesn't necessarily have access to. And this, this ties on very nicely with the stuff that Eric was talking about earlier with the field expansion, is that anything that you could have done in a field expansion, you can do here. So really any field that you can see in the API, you can inject into your destination URL. So you essentially get that for free even when making calls back to your server and these calls remain authenticated and there's, there's little uh, permission checks that you need to do server-side. Exactly, yep. Well, it looks like you guys were being kept pretty busy this year. Uh, were there any major challenges that you ran into in building uh, that kind of add-on framework? You wanna take this or? Okay, uh, so the challenge, I don't know, like the, the, the funny thing is, that is, is it's some of this stuff not all of it, but some of this stuff sort of came uh, came about um, organically, if you will. Like uh, we didn't really set out to solve the the problems the way that we're presenting them now. Um, the, the the proxy idea, which turned out to be uh, very powerful and very useful, um, sort of came out of a uh, out of an internal itch. 
uh, the the Connect framework uh, is is pretty powerful, uh, so much so that we started using it uh, internally to build uh, new features for Bitbucket as Connect add-ons. Um, also, as a proof that you know this stuff is really as functional as it should be, um, because we can build part of Bitbucket on it. And um, and pipelines like the built-in integrated CI tool in Bitbucket um, is a Connect add-on. So Bitbucket itself does not do CI really. It's a it's a Connect add-on. Anybody could build something like this, and it would look the same, and it could perform the same. Um, however, uh, with uh, uh, pipelines as a completely separate microservice that Bitbucket Core knows nothing about, um, we ran into an issue with publishing an API because pipelines needed to publish an API, and that API needs to be part of look like the Bitbucket API. And so, like the object inflation inst uh, thing, for instance, came directly from there. Like we invented sort of the concept of proxying that traffic through Bitbucket, so it would live on the Bitbucket domain. And then, uh, and, but all, obviously, the, the, the you know, microservice backend uh, wasn't going to uh, understand all the various fields of a repository, but it did need to include repositories in its responses. And so that's where this came from. And it wasn't until like all that stuff was built and it, and it ran that uh, we sort of uh, realize that you know what this we built this for an internal thing, but this applies just as well to any external add-on, and uh, and that's when we we sort of opened it up. So some of this stuff sort of yeah was was organic. I guess in a similar vein, I I I think we tried to paint a picture of how we tried to tie all of everything that we've done together to have this one nice object model that Bitbucket serves, and you can reuse that object model throughout all the various ways that you can extend Bitbucket. Uh, in hindsight, it, it completely looks like that was the right thing to do. Uh, but when we were developing it, I don't think all of this was obvious to us. And so we had some various steps where we had like the way that you would access a lot of this data was completely separate in the different ways that you could try and extend Bitbucket. And over time, we've been trying to make sure that we have one cohesive story that is how you interact with Bitbucket, no matter if you're trying to extend it just with a REST API or if you want to embed things into Bitbucket or you're going down and using the proxy. It's really awesome that you guys uh, made this available to third-party add-on developers. Uh, this feature is brand new. It's only in Bitbucket Cloud right now, and I was able to take advantage of it because of the help I received from uh, Chris and Eric during Connect Week. Uh, if you are an add-on vendor and you have a new add-on idea or maybe you have a series of features you want to add on top of your existing add-on and you want to expedite that process, I highly recommend looking into applying to Connect Week uh, because that is a place where you can work on your add-on live with uh, Atlassian's engineers, product managers, designers, in, uh, Atlassian staff from pretty much the entire company that will help you make your add-on a success uh, in a duration of a week in a fun hackathon-like environment. And I certainly had fun there and the result is that uh, my coworker and I were able to ship this class diagram add-on for Bitbucket. Uh, I, I don't think we would have done it in just around a week uh, without that extra boost. So uh, thank you a lot, guys. We have a yeah, few sure. minutes left uh, for questions. So if you have any questions, please uh, share them in chat or in a special Q&A module. We, we had one question from Andrew about the I think it was back when we talked about object uh, field expansion. Uh, the question was, does that logic go into the URL? I, I imagine the, the, the queries that you showed, does that go into the URL when you make requests? Yes, exactly. So uh, indeed, so it's a, the concept itself is not unique to Bitbucket. We didn't invent anything. Um, and so these are just create parameters. And so let me go back to here, this slide. Which one is it? Here, as an example. Yep. So um, question mark fields equals uh, uh, minus links, for instance. And uh, that's what you would add. And uh, the uh, the filtering thing is very similar. And so like the this thing, um, like this this query, this query string effectively, um, you uh, URL encode it as a query parameter, and then you put it in the queue uh, parameter. This is what it looks like, by the way. I didn't bring this slide up because it's kind of ugly. Um, but if you are, uh, if you're hitting the pull request endpoint and you want to run like a complicated, oops, uh, create as complicated um, as as this, yada 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 yada, then 
what the URL really ends up looking like is this pull request question mark, Q equals, and then this whole string URL encoded with all the spaces and quotes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so that is how that works. It's very straightforward. Great. Uh, I actually have a question uh, back to your experience developing this whole API uh, object expansion framework and how you were able to successfully put it in Connect. It looks like it, it does offload a lot of work on uh, your back end. Were there any challenges in making sure that this performs well and that caching works on all the levels as your uh, internal code makes fetches all these all these entities needed for request? And I, I think there's two answers to that. Was one is that we have tried to make our APIs lazy in a lot of places where we can so that we're not paying the cost. Um, but I think the, the more important insight for us was that we weren't really saving the cost by not doing this proxy. Because if somebody wanted to develop this functionality, in the past what they would have had to do is write their add-on so that they didn't get all this information, and then they would actually end up issuing a whole bunch of additional requests to Bitbucket to try and piece this information together. So it, it, each one of those requests may have been cheaper, but they would have had to make so many more requests that it would generate more load on Bitbucket to, to support this, that kind of thing that they wanted to do. Um, whereas in this, we, we kind of do that all in one shot, and we actually have more opportunities for optimization, knowing that everything is going to happen in that one request. That's a great answer. Makes sense. Uh, thanks, Chris. Anything, well, anything else you'd like to add? It, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think, uh, yeah, it was a great opportunity to run through a lot of this stuff uh, in, in half an hour. Uh, yeah, I think we, we ran through the, uh, like the, the more interesting parts of, uh, of our, our journey on, on sort of API design and, and, uh, and, and usage of it as well, because we're consumers of our APIs right, through that Connect system and, and building microservices on top of it. So yeah, no, I'm pretty happy with uh, the opportunity. Yes. Thanks yeah, for thanks, thanks a lot for joining the show. Uh, for our guests, do check out Connect Framework, whether you're building a Bitbucket add-on or a Confluence add-on or a Jira add-on. It's a really, really well thought out framework. Um, I also want to give a quick plug at uh, our uh, the the, the add-on that we built, the class diagrams add-on. It's now live in Bitbucket, available to install via the marketplace, as uh, Eric demonstrated. Also, we will be at Atlassian Summit US in San Jose, so stop by our booth, say hi, check out all the add-ons that we have, and uh, I think Chris and Eric are going to be there too. Is that right? We might. We might maybe. I'm not entirely we sure might. yet. But there will be tons of people. I'm not sure that yes. we will be If they're not going to be there, there will be uh, other uh, developers and uh, Atlassian staff representatives. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you have a good rest of the day. Thank you.